Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Exclusion Podcast. And once again, we are going to try the dual median. So uh, we are recording um, in a podcast form and also through our new YouTube channel. So that's kind of exciting. And once again, we have Alicia and Marcy, and we have a special guest today. Her name is Kimberly Gerling. So thanks for joining us, Kimberly. Thanks for having me. And uh, Kimberly is the interim um, executive director with Evidence for Democracy, and she's joining us from Ottawa, Ontario. So yes, welcome to the podcast. And and uh, no, I guess that's all I'm supposed to say. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried to print everything off today and it wouldn't print. My printer is not working. So I'm trying to do two things at once here. So I apologize. <laughs> yeah. And before we jump right into the, into the interview, um, as always in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, we acknowledge that this podcast is being recorded on the traditional territories and oral practices of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta and Region 3 Métis Nation, as well as the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And we acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on these lands and to all who assist in their stewardship for generations to come. <clears throat> all right, so a little bit about Kimberly. As I mentioned, she's the interim director of Evidence for Democracy, a Canadian nonprofit organization promoting the transparent use of evidence in government decision making. Kimberly holds a PhD in neuroscience from the University of British Columbia and is alumnus of the MITEX. Canadian Science Policy Fellowship, a program connecting scientists to policy issues in the Canadian government. She works, she's worked for several years as a policy analyst in the Canadian public sector. So welcome today, and then we're excited about our discussion. Thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So first, Kimberly, can you tell us a bit about why the not-for-profit Evidence for Democracy was created and, uh, and what it is you do? Sure. So we are a nonprofit. We're nonpartisan. We're based here in Ottawa. And we've been around since about 2012, 2013 or so. And at the time, there was a lot of concerns about science being really, we, we really had an anti-science government at the time. So during the Harper days, there was a lot of muzzling of federal scientists, cuts to science, um, really a lot of challenges around evidence-based decision-making. And at the time, the science community was really frustrated by these challenges. So the founder, the co-founder of the organization, Katie Gibbs, um, actually co-organized a rally here in Ottawa called the Death of Evidence Rally, where she had scientists come and take to the streets and actually marched in protest to the sort of anti-science government at the time. And scientists were so mobilized around this sort of taking action that I don't think that the science community really does very often, that there was a lot of motivation to keep that momentum going. And so the organization was founded at the time to kind of keep pushing for a government that, that put science on the forefront. And so since then, we've really grown and developed. Um, it's really great now. We have a government that has really made science on the forefront, but we've continued to sort of expand our work. So basically, we do three different types of work, the first being issue-based advocacy campaigns. So we work on particular issues. Uh, we help the science community and the public advocate for science and the use of evidence in government. We do education and training on issues like science communication, helping scientists and the public understand how policy is made and engage with that process. Uh, and then we also do research on topics relating to science capacity and evidence-based policy in governments, both federal and provincial. Oh, that's wonderful. That's super important. I used to, um, I like how you used to work for government too, because so you have both of those, those perspectives. Yeah, it's um, kind of great at the interface of those two worlds. Yeah, and it's so important. To, um, I used to work for government as well, and there's definitely that knowledge translation problem between, you know, research academics and policymakers, and they almost speak a totally different language, right? So that's so important and that's such a big gap that you're filling by doing that education and training um, and, uh, and doing that knowledge translation work to make it the policymakers have, you know, the best, the best evidence for their decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we really want to sort of help bridge the gap between those two worlds. You know, having worked as a scientist and working in the, in the government space, I think that there's a lot of motivation on both sides, but sometimes it could just be challenging to make those connections. And so we really would try and work on building better 
connections and bridges between the science world and the policymaking world. So this ties into the work that you did last year. Um, you led a study called Evidence in Action, an Analysis of Information Gathering and Use by Canadian uh, Parliamentarians. So can you tell us a little bit about this study and what you learned? Sure. So, I mean, when the Trudeau Liberals were, were elected in 2015, they really did make science and evidence-based policymaking a part of their platform. And, and since then, there's been a lot of changes in the government about, you know, like letter, um, language in the mandate letters about evidence-based decision-making. We have a, a chief science advisor. Um, you know, there's been a lot of mechanisms in place to try and push for evidence-based policy, but we really still, you know, have a hard time understanding what that actually means. So what, what does evidence-based decision-making actually look like in practice? So to help us better understand that, what we did is we did a study where we actually interviewed Canadian members of parliament about how they find and use evidence. So when they need information, where do they go to get it? How do they evaluate information? What types of information do they find valuable? Um, and then we also asked them a little bit about the role of research and evidence in their work um, and sort of what they sort of saw as is important for evidence-based policy, what, as well as sort of their incentives and challenges around evidence-based policy. Um, and what we found is that MPs were really motivated to use the best available evidence, but they found there are a lot of challenges to actually doing that in practice. And so the study was trying to help understand where those gaps were and then help us in our work better understand how we could connect that science up to those decision makers. Okay, interesting. Um, did you look at oh, any of the, in the public service at all? I'm just curious. And those that are kind of doing that research and briefing up? We didn't in, in this context because, you know, we are a small organization and we were limited in the scope and the time of the work. But I mean, I think that a lot of the things that we found in this study, especially having worked in the public service, were a lot of the same challenges that policy analysts and the sort of executive branch of government would would find in their own work. So, for example, you know, MPs told us, well, it's it's we want to find and use the best available evidence, but there's just so much information coming across our desks that how do I actually know what to trust or, or what's the most important evidence? Or, you know, well, I'm not an expert in science, so how am I supposed to evaluate something that's a rapidly changing scientific topic? Or, you know, I only have so much capacity and we're already totally at the, at the limit of what we need to do. And in my experience working as a public servant, it's really the truth anywhere. Like it's not just in a parliamentarian's office. It's the same for a, a policy analyst or, you know, a, a deputy minister or an assistant deputy minister. Um, so I think that a lot of the challenges we heard in the study can be applied to the public service as well. I actually wrote a piece in Apolitical about the same topic and sort of expanding the work into the public service. But um, yeah, we didn't look at it specifically, but I think that a lot of the findings could be extrapolated to the public service as well. Oh, excellent. Um, also, Kimberly, as of late, you've been providing guidance on the use of evidence-based approaches to, to crises such as the COVID-19. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? And have our leaders and decision makers been using evidence-based best practices to make their decisions? Um, I found in the, the Globe and Mail had found a study called Canadian Pandemic Influenza Plan for the Health Sector from 2006 that was prepared with you know, intense kind of federal and provincial input that was co-authored by our current Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Tam. Mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't in that position at that time, but essentially she kind of laid out this pandemic playbook mm -hmm. 14 years ago, you know, so are, so what are your thoughts on that? Like are our <laughs> leaders, you know, learning from these things or are they using it currently? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think I've been sort of watching things unfold with the lens of science and research, maybe not surprisingly. And I think honestly, our government has done a really good job of, of really using science and research in their decision making, even from the beginning. I mean, having Teresa Tam being the one delivering the message, as well as the provincial health officers often being the ones delivering that message, I think has been sending a really clear message to the Canadian public that scientists are the ones who are advising our response. I know Justin Trudeau from the very beginning has been using the language of 
you know, this is what the science is telling us to do. We're listening to researchers. And I think that this has just been further demonstrated by some of the recent investments in science and research. So last week, the government announced over a billion dollars towards science and research response to COVID-19 for things like testing, for vaccine development, for tracing of the, the virus across the government. There was also, you know, an announcement of things like a new task force around COVID-19. Um, and then we've also seen our, our chief science advisor, where I mean the government has sort of put in place a lot of mechanisms to sort of help science advice in the government. And the chief science advisor, Dr. Mona Niemer, has actually been taking a lot of steps within her office as well. So there's now um, a platform called Can COVID, which is about bringing together scientists across Canada to share their work, to collaborate, to advance communication, and then also an, an expert advisory network to help advise the chief science advisor to provide the best available evidence to, um, to the government as well. So I think that we've been doing a pretty good job um, here in Canada to really put science on the forefront, um, as well as just ensure that our response is informed by the, the best available science. And I hope that, um, you know, I think that there's like lots that will come from this. I mean, I was, I was talking to someone earlier today actually about um, the UK who has had for a long time a program called Science Advice During Government Emergencies or SAGE. And I know in the last Chief Science Advisor's report here in Canada, she was talking about looking, so we, I mean, our Chief Science Advisor is quite new here in Canada, um, but she was looking to other governments for advice on you know, how to improve Canada's science advisory network here. And that was something that came up. But I think that this is a really clear example of where, you know, we're building these responses during an emergency that I hope will sort of lead to more lasting mechanisms to make sure that we can really access that science and use it really rapidly during an emergency. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot happening and I, I hope that this leads to continued work around bridging the gap between science and policy making. Uh -huh. Excellent. Um, so just to pivot slightly and talk a bit more about um, gender. Mm -hmm. So I think Alicia and I um, know that especially, you know, with women in politics and women in STEM, we need role models for little girls to see and to learn from and to kind of, and to make it normal and see, you know, it's normal for women to be in those roles. They belong there and they're accepted there. Um, and coupled with the fact that we know diversity brings better decision making with it um, and that we need, you know, representation and people in power that understand all of our needs. So how important has it been that many of the positive public figures of the pandemic worldwide have been female leaders and, uh, and also with the chief medical officers that are women? Yeah, well, I think it's a really, really good thing. I mean, we've been seeing more and more as this has happened that you know countries and, and groups that have been really responsive have oftentimes had these female leaders which is a really good example of how you know i think that that, that women are generally really underrepresented in positions of political power um i mean we see that even here in canada where we've been really pushing for diversity and i think that this is a really clear example of you know the importance of of strong women in positions of power that will serve as an example for you know other women who might be inspired to get involved in political decision making. I also, I mean, I, I'd love to see some data on the different styles of leadership of, of female leaders versus male leaders because I mean it's I'm I'm saying this very anecdotally, but I think that one of the reasons that female leaders have been so successful in the midst of all of this is that their leadership style has often come off with this sort of trusting kind of sensitive response when people are really looking for support during very uncertain times. Um, and I think that, that that kind of leadership style is often looked upon as like weak, um, whereas it's been really successful in the midst of an emergency, which is really interesting. Um, but I hope that this will actually kind of just build some public trust in our women leaders, which I hate that that's kind of the truth, but I find that women face a lot more scrutiny in positions of political leadership. Um, you know, they're 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 criticized for things like how they dress and how they talk. And um, to see so many women in positions of power during all of this has been super inspiring. And I hope that it it starts to pave the way for more women on on political platforms. 
and in positions of, of you know, trust in our political spectrums. Well, and it's been interesting because how often have you seen a male leader uh, in crisis and all of a sudden they've made t-shirts with their faces on them or created shoes that have their name on them. So it is crazy how even in time of crisis, when we are trusting the women, we still gender <laughs> the response by uh, raising money, by putting you know, a feminist spin on it. So I find that, that interesting. And, and, and I guess one way you can push back on it is well, maybe men should dress better. But it, it also, I think that it just still shows you that we still put this this uh, gendered lens on them when they're up there, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I was having this conversation the other day, too, that, that while it's really great, I think that it's still, you know, sort of, there's still this stereotype that women should be in these, like, caring positions. And a lot of the women who have been on the front lines have been public health officers and physicians and people in these caring spots. Whereas it's still sort of reinforcing a gender stereotype of, well, it should be the women who are taking care of us during this time, um, rather than being like the, the strong iron fist. Um, so while it's great, like I, I agree that it's still sort of reinforcing some of the stereotypes that we're seeing and that we've seen in the past. For sure. So this pandemic has been bringing awareness to many blind spots that we have in society. And how can using an EDI um, lens through evidence-based policy creation, how can we use that to fill some of the gaps that we're seeing even right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot during this pandemic is that it has really, because it's something that we're all experiencing on the global scale, um, it's really magnified inequities. And I mean, it's forced us to really rapidly think about people who are marginalized during this crisis and try and come up with creative solutions to take care of people. And we've seen this with, you know, steps taken for, you know, I, I, it's not universal income, but, you know, emergency response benefits for people who are out of work. You know, our government has taken steps to sort of help protect women who have been in in unsafe home situations. We've, I, in Vancouver, we saw um, the, the rolling out of a safe supply program for substance users, which has been a really hard policy to sort of push forward. Um, so I think that it's, it's magnified inequities and it's, it's really put in the spotlight, people who are marginalized, whether that's because of gender or race or, or you know, in, impoverishedness. Um, I, I think that this is, it's a good moment for us to be examining what's happening in our societies and thinking about how to protect those people. And I think that the important step during this is to be collecting information on how this pandemic is impacting different groups of people and then coming up with solutions and how to protect them. And I hope that that will continue after the pandemic as well to actually get a better sense of how different people are impacted, not only by this, but by other challenging situations as well. Um, and I know, so for example, Stats Canada has been collecting data from the Canadian public since the beginning. So if you haven't actually seen it, there's a survey that, that Stats Canada put out on how the pandemic is impacting different groups of people. It only takes about five minutes, but they're trying to get a better sense of how the pandemic is impacting um, diverse people across Canada. And then now with the task force announced, part of that will be to also do better data collection around COVID-19. And so I'm hoping that, like, I think that this is a really good moment for us to be really examining how different people in Canada are, are impacted by challenging situations and come up with policy solutions that are informed by evidence. And if, if not now, the, this, there's, this is no better time to start those conversations. Well, and I think sometimes there's this misconception that when we talk about evidence-based theory or evidence-based science, that we're only thinking about their traditional sciences. And we forget how much interdisciplinary work is being done and how that is important as well. And I know Marcy and I, we work quite, quite heavily on gender-based analysis, GBA+, plus, and how that can be applied to any, anything, including the sciences, and how important that is to add into policy. And I, I, I listened to actually a podcast yesterday where um, an economist was mentioning how she's putting a gendered lens on some of the responses and how, um, and Marcy, you and I have talked about this, how 
um, gender neutral policies can actually have gendered consequences. And she spoke about how in Saskatchewan's response, for example, they don't have opening up daycares until like the fourth step. So you think that, oh, we're doing things that are positive and that are gender neutral, and then you forget that a good chunk of the Saskatchewan population uh, has women working, and if they don't have care, they are the care. <laughs> so how are they supposed to go back to work at steps one, two, and three if there's not a place for their children to go until step four? So do you have anything to say about maybe some of the responses that have been happening and maybe within these blind spots, what we might still be missing? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I think that part of the challenge has been, you know, they're trying to roll out policies super quick. And so you, I mean, which has been amazing to see the government be able to like be super responsive and get things like money out to people. Um, and they're trying to make decisions so fast. Um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I was reading an article today too about how so many women are, are actually overrepresented on the front lines. You know, there are people who are like the healthcare workers who are now also expected to be, you know, providing care for their students. My sister is actually a teacher and said that they in Manitoba have been having conversations about the amount of time that people should be expected to be spending on education with their children and how her family is many of whom are also, you know, essential workers in grocery stores or, you know, on the front lines with nurses. Um, are feeling really stressed about, you know, their ex expectations that they're supposed to be working full time, but then also educating full time and also parenting full time, which is totally unreasonable. And so I think that it's while it's amazing to be seeing, you know, this this response of science and research, I think you're exactly correct in making sure that social science research is also really boosted during this time because you're totally right in saying that we often forget that those social sciences in terms of how different communities are being impacted, you know, the mental health aspects of all of this and how we're going to respond from this, because it's honestly trauma for a lot of people. And, and how are we going to sort of recover from that is just as important in designing a long-term kind of response plan for all of this. Because it's not just about reopening the economy. It's not just about making sure we have a vaccine. It's also about making sure that we have resilient communities that are able to return to normal, not just in the like, can I go back to my job sense? Absolutely. I saw a statistic that said 60% of women are employed in occupations that are important right now. And a lot of them are around the five C's and this is caring, clinical, catering, cashiering, and cleaning. And mm -hmm. right now the caring, cashiering, and cleaning are right at the front of the line. So then definitely when you end up with those intersection, intersections where you are um, doing the cleaning or doing the cashiering, or like you mentioned, the caring uh, in, the, in the healthcare field, you also are at home doing the caring for the children. And it, it's definitely causing this, this intersection of um, almost compiling uh, issues that, that uh, yeah, it's gonna cause long-term trauma um, not just with those on the front lines and what they're experiencing, but also that comes home, right? So um, yeah. it, it is a challenging time. And I, I know you also mentioned when we were chatting about um, within that statistical data that they're, they're gathering, the stats data, how there's some things that we're gathering that we, we've been lacking in the past, such as mental health data, housing crisis data, uh, workers' rights, that seems to be something that's really at the front right now is uh, a lot of the people that have been in the shadows and haven't had a chance to have a voice are all of a sudden right at the front, right? Like we look yeah. at the meat packing plants and that one hits me pretty hard because where I come from, Saskatchewan, we actually have a chicken plant right in our, <laughs> right on Main Street. It is the heart of our town. And if uh, what's happening in Alberta were to happen in my small town, that would be, it would be devastating because it would hit everybody. So um, it's definitely bringing awareness to workers' rights, workers' safety. Yeah. And uh, I think those are things that have been lost in the past. It's interesting too, to have the conversation about what is an essential service, because I think that for so long we've put things like service industry people, grocery store clerks, you know, delivery people in this box of, of like professions that people choose when they can't get a job somewhere else or they're encouraged to not be in this. And then suddenly now these people are indispensable to the community. And I think that shift of our perceptions around the role of 
the framework of our society and and really being forced to examine what our society would look like without those people. I mean, even, you know, looking at service staff and restaurants, like one of the things that I know lots of people have like mentally been challenged by is the, the inability to like go to restaurants and sit with their friends. And, and we, I think collectively as a community sort of have dismissed those, those positions as not being an, as an important framework of our society. And so I think that it's really important for us to be thinking about, you know, our, our reframing of what essential work looks like and making sure that no matter what industry you work in, you have the right to, to a salary that's, that's comfortable and, and to be safe and supported. Um, so I think that that's an, a conversation that will be hard to ignore moving forward. And I mean, here in Ontario, we, we were previously, um, there was a, a trial for universal basic income that was happening before the Ford government was elected. And then when the, the government was elected, it was stopped. Um, so I'm hoping that this will be some initiative for those kinds of universal basic income programs to start rolling out again, because I mean, what we're seeing now with the CERB, the emergency response benefit, is kind of that right now. And it's interesting to see what, how that was evaluated in terms of what a basic income should look like to take care of Canadians. And I hope that there's some data collection looking at how that's impacting Canadians moving forward. And I think it's also brought attention to the unpaid work. And, and we just had our last podcast talking with not-for-profit sectors. And it, it, in Alberta here, we already have the most not-for-profits per capita in the world. We have um, billions of dollars of uh, GDP contributions from our not-for-profit sector. Yet we are out here right now calling for more volunteers. So it shows you that even when you have some of the most volunteers per capita in the country or even in the world, how it's not enough in time of crisis and how these people are often overlooked or forgotten. Uh, there's um, discussion now about how a good chunk of the volunteers are the women who are now doing other care issues and can't be there, or they could be from the retirement sector who are higher risk, so they can't help. So it shows you when that we create society in a, in a way that uh, is so reliant on unpaid work, how uh, we can have a breakdown that we need systems in place that don't need those types of unpaid labor. Because let's be honest, uh, if we focus everything on unpaid labor, those are the people that are forgotten policy. So I'm happy to see that they're, they're coming to the forefront and being noticed because I think for a long time we've forgotten about these people and we haven't, you know, the stay at home moms, the, the uh, volunteer network, all of these people have been forgotten in policy for a really, really long time. Yeah, and, and they're oftentimes more heavily weighted towards women. And I think that that's important to recognize. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are um, hitting our time limit. So just before we conclude, um, is there anything else that, uh, that we missed that you'd like to share or um, that's important to discuss on this topic? Uh, no, I mean, I think we covered it. If, if anyone, I mean, I know this is more on the science side and less on the diversity side, but if anyone is interested in learning more about what's happening in science around COVID-19 uh, and the role of the science community in responding to that, um, Evidence for Democracy is actually holding a live Q&A on May 5th, which I'm happy to share with you. Uh, and that Q&A will include um, a representative from the Chief Science Advisor's Office who is going to speak a little bit to the CSA's response around science, um, a Departmental Science Advisor from the Department of Health who will be speaking about the CAN COVID network and the efforts around coordinating scientists around Canada, and then two scientists who have been running a grassroots organization or a grassroots response called uh, covid19resources.ca about sort of sharing best practices and lists of resources around COVID. And so we're going to be doing that on Facebook Live on the 5th. If anyone is interested in learning a little bit about what's happening around science and COVID-19, um, it would be interesting too to have some conversations about social science in that Q&A too. So um, yeah, that's the, the only thing I'll add. Absolutely. Sure. And one other thing, if, if there's a researcher um, that hadn't heard of Evidence for Democracy, 
but that would like to get connected or share their research with you or find, learn how they could um, connect it or translate it for policymakers. Um, can you share how, how, how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a website, which is just evidenceforDemocracy.ca. And on that website, you can find more information about the organization. We have a whole training page where all of our previous webinars and toolkits are available for free. Um, and then you can also sign up to uh, volunteer. You can sign up to get our newsletter where we share lots of stuff that's happening around Canada. We are a Canada-wide organization. So although we don't have official branches in other provinces, um, we have members all across Canada. So we'd be happy to connect you up with um, other folks who are working in your area who are also interested in this too. Fantastic. That's great. Okay, I've been trying to write frantically some key takeaways here. So thank you so much, Kimberly, for joining us today. Remember. And just as a reminder, the study that Evidence for Democracy did last year was Evidence in Action, an Analysis of Information Gathering and used by Canadian parliamentarians. So if we have any parliamentarians that happen to be listening, this is a great uh, resource that you can look to or you can contact Evidence for Democracy. Democracy. And uh, some of the key things that I have written down here is uh, the importance of science when making policy, all kinds of science, uh, the inter interdisciplinary components of science that we shouldn't forget. And uh, we're always about e equity, diversity, inclusion. So how important that is when we're making our policy that we don't forget people along the way. So um, in the current pandemic, we're, it's really showing us some of maybe some missed spots within policy where we haven't put some of these concepts into play before and what we've been missing. And this has been a really great time for a group like Stats Canada to gather data on things that have been missing in the past, whether it be mental health or homelessness or unpaid labor, um, all those C's that we mentioned about that are dominated by women labor, uh, underpaid women, women labor in the past and how that's coming to the forefront. We also discussed about female leadership and how often this is underrepresented in both the sciences and within politics and how there's a chance where we've had the opportunity to have female leaders um, at the forefront of this, but yet we still seem to gender them <laughs> along the way uh, in positives and negatives. And uh, lastly, just um, going forward, this is a great opportunity for all of us to incorporate some of these things we've missed from the past and that really this is our chance to create a future where there's much less uh, groups in society that are forgotten. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we will definitely put in our resource section a lot of the information that you mentioned so that people can get a chance to, to, um, to, to check out what you've been working on. Mm -hmm. Yes, so please don't forget to check out the resources section and you can find, once again, you can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Buzzsprout. Please hit subscribe to be notified when a new episode is released and we'd love if you could leave us a rating or a review or a comment. And let's continue the conversation and as you know, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and now on YouTube, which has been great, and also Instagram. And we would love to hear from you. Leave a comment, maybe mention what you would like us to, to talk about next. We would love to know what our audience would like to hear about. But until next time, bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Kimberly. My pleasure.